The head of a UN team looking into possible war crimes in Yemen has accused Saudi Arabia and the UAE of interference. The panel says both sides of the conflict are to blame for rights abuses. But what can this inquiry achieve in Yemen? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Yemen has been at war for more than three years now. The region's poorest country has been reduced to even further misery as the Saudi Emirati coalition continues to battle Houthi rebels for control. Now, the head of a UN group investigating allegations of abuse in the country says his team faced interference from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The group has submitted its findings to the United Nations. We have a lot to discuss with our guests, but first, Bernard Smith has more. Kamal Jandoubi says the Yemen government's rejection of his team of experts' report is political. He says the Saudis and the Emiratis tried to influence his team. They tried to damage its credibility, but they didn't manage. And indeed, the mandate of the team of experts' work in Yemen has been extended by the UN. But Jandoubi admits that because the Yemen government has, a, has said it's no longer going to cooperate with the team of experts, then that will make their work in Yemen much more difficult. And Jandoubi says that they've submitted a confidential list of names of suspected human rights violators to the UN in New York. I did not expect such harsh reactions. We've done a professional, neutral and objective job. All we did was report based on allegations and actions we collected during our visits from testimonies and reports. It's a normal process for any experts. We can always discuss the results, but this did not happen. Now, the UN's team of experts report into Yemen faults all sides, accuses all parties of human rights violations, but much of the criticism is extended towards the Saudi and UAE-led coalition, specifically for their widespread use of airstrikes on targets in Yemen. All right, let's take a closer look at some of the findings of this report. UN experts accuse Yemen's internationally recognized government, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, of possible war crimes, including torture, rape and illegal detention. The report found that the Saudi Emirati coalition caused what it calls most of the documented civilian casualties. All sides are also accused of recruiting child soldiers. The UN is calling for an immediate end to fighting and for countries to stop selling weapons to those involved in the war. All right, let's bring in our guests in London, Ahmad Adina Jabouri, political commentator and author of Middle East Affairs. And joining us on Skype from New York, Ahmed Ben Shemsi, Advocacy and Communications Director for Middle East North Africa with Human Rights Watch. Welcome to you all. Uh, Ahmad Adina Jabouri, let me start with you. So the head of the UN group of experts on Yemen, Kamal Jandoubi, um, he says that both Saudi Arabia and the UAE tried to interfere in their work what do you say to that, and what is the response from Saudi Arabia and the UAE? Well, obviously, Saudi Arabia or the Arab states collusion, they are there not for invasion of Yemen, but they are there uh, uh, intervened militarily uh, at request of the legitimate Yemeni government. So this is the very essential point to, have and, uh, to understand it. So, but the point is this, uh, there are more than one report, just so we mentioned about less than two months ago, uh, another report. It is either you talk about the humanitarian level, not involved in politics, or talk about politics. For the Arab state collusion, all along, they said we are uh, with the law, uh, international human rights law or the international law, no uh, abuse, no uh, any negative points. Yes, it is war. Obviously, there are some mistakes. The Arab states collusion, they said, admit about, especially with the, about four or five weeks ago with the, the school uh, children uh, bus, you know, and, and they admit it. So it means uh, there is no attention to be against the human rights or to be a violation against the international law. So uh, w this is the most important to, to understand. But we have to say, you know, the UN, uh, they involved with politics, not, not just typically humanitarian level. Uh, Ahmed bin Shemsi, look, uh, we, we talk a lot in the news about the allegations of war crimes uh, uh, being committed uh, in Yemen. Um, uh, 
there have been charges that both sides uh, are committing these war crimes. Uh, could you, with the work that you do, uh, detail to our viewers uh, some of the types of war crimes that you believe are being committed by both sides in Yemen? Well, there are indeed uh, grave violations of the laws of war committed by both sides, uh, and we documented um, them both. So on the Saudi-led coalition side, we have documented unlawful coalition airstrikes, uh, some likely war crimes, as you said. Uh, also, the coalition has used cluster munitions, which are banned internationally, and uh, we have also highlighted the role of the United Arab Emirates in torture and forced disappearances. Uh, on the Houthi side, we have documented indiscriminate shelling, uh, of civilians, which is, again, a violation of the laws of war, uh, the use of anti-personal landmines, uh, the use of torture in the uh, detention centers and forced disappearances, and also uh, the use of uh, child soldiers. Ahmad uh, al-Din so if I can ask you for your response to what you just heard um, uh, uh, Ahmed bin Shamsi say with regards to the allegations of war crimes committed by both the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Well, uh, it is a very clear point. We have to be logically rational when we think. When the, the, the Arab state collusion, they admit if they did some mistakes. The war is war at the end of the day. But do, do, do they have attention to be a violation against the international law or the international uh, human rights law? The answer is no. So uh, this is, we have to be other, uh, as I said, typically in the political part or typically in humanitarian level. So uh, this is, they have no attention to, to uh, civilian people against, uh, I mean, uh, when you talk about the Houthi movement, uh, no, they, they do some, some, not mistakes, but they do uh, have attention to even to attack some, some uh, uh, UN uh, centers, like with the, with the international food for the U UN. Uh, as well, a few weeks ago in Hodeida, within one month, twice the attack, they attack that centers, you know. So they do, this is, this building belongs to the United Nation for the humanitarian uh, part. Why they go there by their forces and to occupy it and, to, and use it as military for them. So obviously this is the, 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 the point of view between the Arab state collusion where they have no attention for the violation and the, hum, uh, the, the Houthi movement where they do have attention to attack some points belong to the United Nation. So we, logically, rationally, you have to think, who to blame? Not to the Arab state collusion, no. But you have to blame Houthi movement. And I, I'll stop to this level. Mr. Bin Shamsi, the UN Human Rights Council voted overwhelmingly in the past few weeks, and despite opposition from Saudi Arabia uh, and from Yemen, to extend the international probe of alleged war crimes. Does that make you feel at all encouraged that enough pressure can be brought to bear on, uh, on the warring parties uh, in Yemen and, or, or on Saudi Arabia and the coalition uh, to try to de-escalate the situation? Well, it is, uh, it is indeed a very positive outcome. We have called for the renewal of the commission and we are pleased that it was renewed because there is an urgent need for more investigations into uh, grave violations of the laws of war by both parties, actually. Uh, as as for uh, the responsibility of the coalition, since uh, 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 my colleague, the, the other guest in, in the show, uh, said that I mean, they're not like responsibility mainly lies on the Houthi side and on the uh, uh, coalition side. There are merely mistakes. I do not agree with that. It is more than just mere mistakes. And and if it was just that, why would the coalition itself? not deploy uh, convincing efforts into investigating those mistakes, quote-unquote. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, the joint uh, uh, coalition investigative reports uh, are extremely insufficient. We also reported about that. They uh, only released initial results, about one paragraph each on only 56 uh, airstrikes, even though we have documented way more than that. Their methodology is unclear. It is non-transparent. Their findings radically and drastically differ from our findings, from the findings of uh, yeah, Amnesty International, from the findings of the UN. Uh, we have provided pretty uh, uh, specific uh, numbers on the violations that were committed by uh, the Saudi side. We have documented 87, and I'm talking just about Human Rights Watch documentation. There are, there's more uh, on uh, from, from other organizations. 87 apparently lawful uh, coalition attacks, nearly, uh, killing nearly uh, 1,000 civilians, including more than 200 kids. Uh, uh, and uh, some attacks amounting to war crimes, a uh, helicopter attacking a boat filled with fleeing Somali refugees, killing uh, women and children, at least 33 of them. 
18 different uh, uh, instances of usage of cluster munitions that are banned internationally. These are very precise facts and findings. So I don't think this is a mere mistake, an, an, an intentional error, as your guest explained. It's more than that. And it needs more investigation. And this is why we applaud that decision to extend the mandate of the investigating committee established by the UN. All right, we'd like to bring in our third guest now uh, from Brighton, Lloyd Russell Moyle, a member of parliament with the UK Labour Party. He's also a member of the Committees on Arms Export Controls. Uh, now, Lloyd Russell Moyle, let me ask you specifically about the sentiment in the UK right now. There has been growing criticism of arms sales uh, from the UK to countries like Saudi Arabia uh, and the United Arab Emirates because uh, those bombs, those munitions are being used in the war effort uh, in Yemen. And so many uh, civilians have been killed there in the past three years. What is the sentiment there in the UK right now? Uh, is there growing criticism of the fact that arms are being sold uh, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE? Well, there is, of course, uh, a huge amount of concern in, um, in, in some significant quarters of uh, society. And we see at the moment a case in the Supreme Court to uh, review and uh, try and overturn some of the government's decisions for arms export controls. Let us remember the government's experts and the civil servants recommended to ministers that the arms should be suspended. But the ministers, the very top of government, overruled it for political reasons. This is a clearly a war that Britain is jointly with um, the coalition to aid and abet what is currently the destruction of large parts of uh, the Yemeni people. Mr. El Jabouri, I, I want to get back to the point that was being made um, about the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Council. I mean, why take such an aggressive tack against the UN Human Rights Council? Why would Saudi Arabia not want this probe to be extended? In the long run, doesn't transparency help? No. Uh, as I said, the Saudi Arabia or United Arab uh, Emirates, they are not against the international law. But you have to understand, you cannot fairly and logically to make one level who they are made coup on the legitimate government and the forces of the legitimate government supported by the Arab state collusion. So when, when United Nations look at the Houthi, who they are, as I said, made coup on the uh, legitimate government, and put them in one level, and they look at them in their report, the reality, the political reality. Yes, they are uh, political reality on the ground, but illegal. They made coup. They should uh, respond and uh, obey to the uh, Security Council uh, number 2016 in uh, 2015. So this is, you cannot close your eyes on it, and you say, uh-oh, Saudi Arabia, same level with the Houthi, who they are, this one legitimate, this one illegitimate, you can't make them in one level and, uh, and talk to them. No, no, uh, you have to talk to the Houthi first. They must uh, obey to the uh, Security uh, Council resolution. If they can't, so you cannot put them in one level. So obviously there is a clash in, in, in this point of view. This is what I meant, that the Arab state collusion, not against the, the international law. The war is war, there is some mistakes, so uh, you cannot put them or judge them in the same level with the Houthi with all along part of the Iranian regime uh, uh, strategic in, in, in the Arabic uh, world. And they don't respond to, A, as I mentioned, the, the Security Council uh, 2016. They don't respond to the initiative of the Arabic state uh, countries. They don't respond even to the Patriot Conference, the General Patriot uh, conference. This is three key points that can't find way to, to end I, the I, war I, I, in the Yemen. But sorry, uh, let me let me go to you, uh, Mr. Russell Moyle. It is, looks like you wanted this, to make a point. Is, go ahead. Well, we've just heard a number of things that are um, objectionable. First of all, the Yemeni government that is recognised at the moment by the international uh, order is not the legitimate government. Uh, the president was the only candidate on the ballot at the elections. His term has long since 
past, he is probably the only head of state in the world that has to have a state visit to visit his own capital. It is not a legitimate government, and that is absolute hogwash. Secondly, the point of what about tree? OK, we all agree the Houthi rebels have probably committed war crimes and awful things, but that doesn't suddenly give you carte blanche to commit war crimes yourself. That is the worst portrayal of the international order. If they've done something bad, doesn't mean you can do something bad. And let's be clear, if we are expecting Saudi Arabia and the coalition to be upholding international law, that means that they can't be selective in it. They can't suddenly say, well, because someone else has done something nasty, we will do something nasty uh, again. Now, let us remember, this was an internal conflict and an internal war until Saudi Arabia and the coalition illegitimately decided to start invading on the advice of the illegitimate Yemeni government to combat the rebels. This is not an international war. It should not be an international war. It is a civil war that needs conflict resolution and dispute management, not more bombs and more murders of children in school buses. Mr. Ben Shemsi, I saw you nodding along there. Did you want to jump in? I know I absolutely second uh, what was just said. Uh, violations on one side definitely do not justify violations on the other side. I just wanted to respond to uh, Mr. Joubert's, uh, uh, you know, statement that you cannot put the coalition on the same uh, side uh, or, or the same level as Houthis. Where actually there's a number in March 2018 of this year, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human rights found that the coalition airstrikes were responsible for 61 percent of the verified civilian casualties. So no, they're not exactly the same place. They're responsible of more deaths than the Houthis. Even though the Houthis are uh, responsible for indiscriminate shelling and sniper fire, as I said uh, earlier, but in terms of verified casualties, the coalition has more. Mr. Ojibori, did you want to respond to any of that? Well, obviously, I full respect to any point of view, but the law is law. I mean, the legitimate government, if some others, they don't look at legitimate, this is up to them. We're talking yes, about the international law. We're it. talking about the League of the Arab States. We're talking about the Arab Gulf countries. These official parts who they uh, agree, this is legitimate government, who they have right to request any help. And they request it from the Arab state collusion to help them. So this is, a, this is why you ignore these things, you know, why you make it small. The whole problem started from Houthi. Houthi, they are part of the Iranian strategy in the area. So we have to look in the picture in the whole, or in four uh, points, I mean, four uh, triangles, not, 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 not to select what we like and ignore what we don't like. This is the whole picture. The whole problem starts from the coup of the Houthi. So the Houthi must respond and obey to the Security Council uh, and other two things, were like, you know, what, what they did in the with the Arab uh, initiative of the uh, Arab state uh, Gulf uh, plus uh, the Patriot International, uh, the General Patriot Conference, who they agreed all along about the, these three three main uh, issues. But the Houthi, why they don't respond correctly? Because as I said, part of the strategy of the Iranians. So their order came from Tehran, not from Sana'a. So this is the whole problem. Otherwise. Today, by, before tomorrow, the war finish in, in, in Yemen, if they respond to these three key points. So mm -hmm. we have to put the pressure, mm -hmm. not at the legitimate government or the Arabic state collusion, but yes. the pressure on the uh, Houthi movement. Mr. Russell Moyle, I can see that you want to jump in. Uh, I'm going to let you have this, your turn here. But, but one second, I also want to ask you as well about the fact that it's a rather opaque system in the UK by which arms are sold to places like Saudi Arabia. And I want to ask you if the public there really knows the extent of arms sales to places like Saudi Arabia. Please go ahead, sir. Well, I, I think this is the problem, isn't it? That um, we currently uh, are selling huge amounts of arms, servicing those arms uh, with British companies and uh, the support of the British military. And there's never been one vote in Parliament about the strategy that, um, that needs to take place. In fact, both the British government and the UN Security Council agree that this conflict will only be resolved through diplomatic means. And they have said that numerous times. No one believes that this conflict will actually be resolved through killing and bombing more people. But the British government continue to license weapons to go um, abroad. Now, the licenses are usually inspected by a civil servant and given a yes or no recommendation. In the case of Britain, they were given a no recommendation to be supplied to Saudi Arabia by the civil servant. But the Minister for Trade... Um, and the very highest in the British 
government overturned the civil servants and the experts on a political decision to take part in the coalition activities. Now, that's fine, but there has been no vote in Parliament. It's fine if the British people are wanting it and there is a vote and it is legitimate, but the reality is there was no vote. The British people have never consented to take part and support the coalition, and the coalition's actions are illegal. They are not upholding any legitimate government. They are killing innocent people and committing Sir, war crimes. I am sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to ask one, one thing to one point it you're making. It doesn't matter what other people do. I just want to ask one thing. What needs to happen for there to be a vote? Well, I suspect the government needs to be forced into admitting that it is um, complicit in some of these crimes. Now, this latest report showing that, um, uh, that, that routinely uh, the coalition has ignored some of the identified safe zones. Um, some of the work showing that the Joint Investigations Unit does not routinely investigate some of the most deadly attacks is providing pressure. And we held an emergency debate in Parliament a few weeks ago, and we intend to continue the pressure so that the government agrees that actually the current situation is untenable. But it requires an enormous amount of pressure, and we are winning Conservatives over because even they are seeing that what is happening and what the Saudis are doing is dreadfully immoral. Uh, Mr. al Jabouri, we don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'd like you to please keep this answer short. What does it mean that the Houthis have freed two sons of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh? Is this some sort of an overture toward the coalition to try to break the deadlock? Well, uh, somehow there is some, something, you know, obviously we cannot follow, we don't know why, because it's supposed to go uh, directly, uh, not uh, indirectly to, 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 to Jordan. So there is something, you know, behind us. We don't know exactly what's the deal for that. But we hope it is a positive point instead of negative point. OK. Uh, Mr. Ben Shemsi, uh, last question here for you. I'm curious about the fact that there is so much criticism uh, within uh, by members of U.S.'s Congress and also within U.K.'s parliament of the fact that weapons are still getting sold to Saudi Arabia and to the UAE. Do you foresee a point by which there is enough pressure uh, in, in these legislative bodies by which arms would stop being sold to Saudi Arabia and to the UAE? Or do you think this is just going to continue? Well, it's difficult to identify a specific turning point. Uh, what I know is that the pressure needs to continue and that there's a growing movement for arms embargo against Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, the European Parliament passed a, a, a resolution calling for a EU arms embargo against Saudi. In France, there is a legal brief that says that there's a high risk that France's continued sales to uh, Saudi Arabia are contrary or might be contrary to international commitments. Uh, uh, in the UK, we discussed that the fact that there's a legal challenge and it's continuing. In Germany, uh, you know, there's a coalition uh, uh, agreement that states that uh, uh, arms export will not be authorized to countries or... Uh, you know, as long as they uh, will be, uh, as long as they are directly involved in the Yemen war. So th there is a, a building pressure and it's a continued process. We only hope that uh, by dint of uh, uh, uncovering more violations and more war crimes, the awareness will grow and then we'll get to a point where it won't be possible to carry on selling weapons to commit war crimes anymore. Mr. Ben Shimsi, uh, we only have about 30 seconds left. Very quickly, how will this criticism of the coalition affect efforts to revive stalled talks to end the war from your vantage point? I'm sorry. To, so well, criticism of the coalition that's been mounting, will this affect efforts to revive stalled talks in the war? Do you think the talks will come about again? Um, honestly, we're not into that kind of analysis. What we do in Human Rights Watch and other human rights organizations is just to monitor the situation on the, ground, on the ground and make sure that civilians are safe and that the laws of war are respected. Of course, we hope for a positive outcome and we vote for negotiations to continue. But that's not our role to say that we should go in this or that direction. Our role is to emphasize the need to respect international uh, humanitarian law in all cases and to uh, ring an alarm bell when so many civilians are senselessly killed. All right. Well, we have run out of time. So thanks to all our guests, Ahmed Ben Shemsi, Imad al-Din al jabouri and Lloyd Russell Moyle. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.